Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for another episode of UNESCO Talks. I'm your host, Gabby Menezes, and today we're talking about the generative AI boom, which has caused a huge amount of energy consumption. This, of course, has an impact on our planet. But it's not all bad news. A new report between UNESCO and UCL shows that there are methods that can be implemented that significantly reduce the amount of energy AI consumes. Here to talk more about the report is UNESCO's Leona Verdadero, who is a program specialist working on AI and digital policy. Leona, thank you so much for joining us. Maybe you could just talk more about the problem. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And yes, so here we'd really like to raise awareness that yes, so training these large language models such as chat GPT-4 from OpenAI that many of us use in our daily lives, right? So whether for work or for school or for hobbies. So actually those big models also comes at a pretty big cost with respect to resources. So one thing when we say training, so imagine all of that data on the internet being fed into this model, an AI machine or system, and then the amount of computational power, or you know, it would need supercomputers to power that type of um, activity. And so this translates into a lot of energy being consumed and on water as well, because all these activities are actually taking place at maybe you've heard of data centers, so massive, massive infrastructures that have high performance computing facilities, and they run on a lot of resources. They're actually both energy hungry and water thirsty. So. I mean, this is just uh, one phase of AI. So we have large language models being trained, but then when we actually want to generate responses, so we type in questions to chat GPT, um, can you just explain a bit more about that and the amount of data that we're generating by our queries? Yes, of course, because what is happening right now, so if we're trying to track you know, everybody's digital interactions, right? So if you think about it, I'm asking ChatGPT, plan me a weekend in Rome, or you know, what's the best recipe for turkey for Thanksgiving, right? But on an individual level, so if it's just me or yourself interacting with the AI, with the ChatGPT, it does not consume a lot of energy. But if you compound everybody's daily interaction, so I think even on a weekly basis, we are averaging a billion prompts or interactions with you know these types of systems so cumulatively that really consumes a lot of energy and water as well putting a strain on existing energy grids and resources. So the report that has just been published has really looked into how we can reduce the energy related to generative AI. Can you talk about the methods that companies can use? Yes, yeah, so we are finding these very novel, innovative techniques. So the first one, if you look at the large language model itself, there are actually ways to compress this. Think about it if you're zipping a file, right? So you're sending an email with a lot of photos and you need to compress the size in order to send this in a faster way. So it's very similar. So you can think of it along the same lines, and this is called quantization. And when we talk to industry and the scientific community, so this is something that's gaining more traction because actually what it does is it saves on energy and it also saves on cost. So if you're a developer, especially you know, in an emerging region and you, know, you have less resources to work with, this is actually a game changer for you. So you're able to build your business, you can build apps on top of these big models and do it in a more efficient way that's good for the environment, and it also saves you on the cost of doing business. So the report also says that there's something we can do as consumers of generative AI, which is basically to make our prompts smaller. Yes, so, so if you think about it, you know, when we're interacting with the system, with the AI, like um, ChatGPT, right? So we're putting in, in, we're giving instructions, we're asking it questions, giving it tasks to do, or sometimes we're uploading big documents. So actually the amount of data or text that we put in makes a big difference. So as a user, one thing is being mindful actually, like, you know, if we can make our instructions or prompts more succinct, that makes a difference. But then of course this is something, you know, that requires more AI literacy or critical thinking, and it's something that would not be happening consciously all the time, right? But still, on the user side, this is very good to know. But what we are also seeing on the 
tech side, with the scientific community, they are coming up with these very, very novel tools that you can actually work with along with these large language models that would essentially do something very similar. Again, like zipping a file, but this time, let's say I'm feeding it you know, a 1,000 word instruction, then I have this um, prompt compression technique that will actually zip all of that information in, put it in the system, and then would give me the output. This is definitely uh, something we should think about with the rise of AI relationships and AI boyfriends. Exactly, right? So then, exactly. So this is also where it would translate, again, in these growing everyday applications of how we interact and use AI. So if we're treating it as a companion, a chatbot that we are constantly interacting with, then that really makes a significant difference. And the report referenced using smaller AI models. Could you explain more about this? Yes. So if you think about large language models, right? So they're also called large because they're meant to be what people call foundational models. So they have everything. And because they have everything, they serve all kinds of use cases, right? From translation, question and answer, any type of other subjects you can think of. But maybe if I'm working on a specific field, I'm in healthcare, I'm in legal analysis, in education, I don't need to access such a big model all the time. So for tasks that are more specific, so if I'm translating very distinct languages, right, or if I'm working in science, then I could actually opt to use a smaller language model that's dedicated specifically to that task. And so, you know, it meets my needs, my use case, and also because it's smaller, it consumes less energy and also more cost effective for me to implement. So Leona, are there companies that are working with generative AI that are actually implementing solutions to the huge consumption of energy? Yes, yeah, so actually one um, exciting initiative that we're seeing, it was recently launched, it's by Hugging Face. So Hugging Face, they're an open source AI platform. So they host a lot of these large language models on their platform and they came up with this idea to have an energy score rating for different AI models. So the idea is it will provide information to an AI developer in choosing their models based on different tasks, activities, and seeing the energy footprint side by side. And you know, the idea is presented with that information, with that data, would it make the AI user developer, you know, would it stimulate for them to make an eco-conscious choice in choosing the eco-friendly model, right, that would consume less energy? And one of the things that the report also highlights is the disparity in geographic locations of AI. Why are we concerned about this? Yes, yeah, so, so really for us, this is, you know, there's a big risk that at, with what's happening right now with generative AI, the way it's being developed still remains largely inaccessible to the global majority. So if you think about this, so globally over 2.5 billion do not have internet access, right? So, so what does that mean? We can't have these bigger and bigger models that require so much computational power that they cannot be deployed in regions where there's limited access to electricity, people don't have connectivity, people don't have stable energy grids. So it's also why it's very important for us in this report to look at what are these very sustainable strategies for AI where it could be developed and deployed in these low resource settings. And so that's why we end the report saying, oh, you know what, let's pay attention to small language models because they seem to have these benefits that combine energy efficiency, can run on limited connectivity with local data, and also more cost effective. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. That's super interesting, and I hope our audience will look at the whole report. And thank you for joining us for another episode of UNESCO Talks. As always, please leave your questions and comments in the chat, and we will get back to you.